97. Doctrine of Selective Depravity, Part 3. Calcedon Report, Number 134, October 1976. The doctrine of selective depravity creates a political order and a law structure after its own image. In an earlier era, when kings and noblemen ruled, and again in the age of aristocracy, it was a common conviction that the rabble were incapable of morality and order unless kept firmly in check by a powerful force. Intelligence, virtue, responsibility and the ability to rule were powers communicated by blood and rank. Later, this idea of a ruling elite took various other forms. The Germans, Anglo-Saxons, the Whites, the Workers, the Freemasons and so on, and now it is gaining modern forms in Asia and Africa, where such ideas have long existed. Marxism, of course, holds militantly to one version of this faith, We have seen that the final implication of the doctrine of selective depravity is salvation by murder. Eliminate the evil group. Of course, re-education is often attempted first, but in a society of failures, as in Marxism and fascism, there must be a sacrificial victim for the continued failures. The evil class or race must therefore be purged In the meantime, however, the people are told that their political order is their saviour and that salvation is a matter of law, and in democracies, this also means elections. Elect the right people who will pass the right laws, and salvation will arrive or be accomplished. More social security, Medicare, more taxes on the rich or middle classes or poor, more this and that kind of legislation, and paradise will begin. The program of salvation by law means legislating against certain people in favour of other people. It means legislating against the rich, the poor, the middle classes, this or that, race or class, or whatever group is defined as evil. It is easy, of course, for the devout believers in the doctrine of selective depravity to catalogue the sins of the evil class. We all have our share of sins, On one trip, a man tried hard to convince me of the special depravity of the oil companies and the international bankers. All our problems and evils he traced to them. When I tried to present a biblical doctrine of sin, he was rude, arrogant and hostile. I had a duty to keep quiet and listen to him, or else I would lead people astray with my ignorance. Later, his wife apologised for what I learned was his chronic behaviour, and added, I don't know anything about the oil companies and bankers, but I do know from living with my husband that they have no monopoly on sin. Exactly. There is no monopoly on sin. No class, race or group has a corner on the sin market, although all nowadays seem to be trying. Legislation, as well as thinking, which has as its premise the doctrine of selective depravity, not only denies the facts about all men, but it denies the very idea of justice. True justice, God's justice, requires that we be blind to the people involved, but alive to God's requirements. It is in this sense that justice is blind, blind to human prejudices, partisanships and claims, but alive to the law of God. God declares, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honour the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbour. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 15 We are not justified before God's law by our estate. Rich or poor, believer or unbeliever, clergyman or layman, our estate is not a determining factor. But God's law is at all times to govern all men. At the same time, we cannot, in rigorously applying God's law, forget that we are also under it, and that the person on trial is our neighbour. We cannot treat him as a different kind of humanity, 
in whom selective depravity is operative. As the old expression has it, we are to remember, there, but for the grace of God, go I. The doctrine of selective depravity overthrows justice because it legislates in terms of class, race or group, It declares a segment of humanity to be the depraved elements by nature because of their membership in a class, race or group. Injustice then becomes a way of life, as it is now, in varying degrees all over the earth. Moreover, if we believe that some other group is the selectively depraved group, then it easily follows that they will decide that we are the selectively depraved blight upon the earth present-day economic and political thoughts begins and ends, on the whole, in terms of the doctrine of selective depravity. The returns are now coming in. Politics has long operated on this premise of selective depravity. Now, more and more people are concluding that the depraved class is the political one, politicians and bureaucrats. Terrorists are increasingly in evidence everywhere and political assassinations are becoming common because the true believer in selective depravity believes finally in salvation by murder. The solution is then simple. Kill the men of the establishment and freedom and paradise will be born. Hence, death to the pigs or death to the establishment in its every form. Salvation by murder becomes a passionate faith and hope. And I do mean passionate, as I have often seen. For example, on one occasion, I argued with a university student who believed in selective depravity. He lost his temper and began to shout that all the pigs in power should be killed and I should be, quote, prevented, end quote, from going around the country corrupting people. It does not take too much pressure for such people, whatever their politics, to express their demands for murder. Consider then what hard times will do to many of them. It will push them over the edge in demands for revolutionary or for repressive reactionary actions. Salvation by murder will become a faith in action. Reasoning with such people will not work. The premise of their thinking, whatever their professed politics or religion, is a false doctrine of man a doctrine of selective depravity. Nothing short of a return to the total word of God can give men and nations a new direction.